let's get started with recruiting. And the reason that the recruiting topic kind of came up is originally we're going to talk about just specifically about Cedric Urban Jr.'s decommitment. And I think both of us have mixed feelings on it, mm-hmm. Sean. And, and, and I'm speaking for both of us because we talked about it. And part of the mixed feelings are so, so talking to sources, and, and I haven't heard anything from the Notre Dame side on this yet. Talking to some folks on the, the Cedric Irvin Jr. side of it, it sounds like Notre Dame told them they didn't have room for him anymore, which I have mixed feelings on. Number one is, you know, look, the kid committed to the previous staff, basically, not not Dylan McCullough. Uh, he committed more to, to Lance Taylor and Brian Kelly. The relationship that Lance had with his dad, I believe they coached together at Alabama back in the day when they were first getting into the coaching profession. And since then, he has done everything right. He has not visited other schools. Cedric has not visited other schools. He's been very pro Notre Dame, selling Notre Dame to other recruits. It's kind of like, I, I feel like, Sean, he was sort of, he is a byproduct of the previous way of doing things. And this is what it came down to. He is a byproduct of the way it used to be at Notre Dame, which is nice player, but why are you taking them that early? It's because you could. Right. And it's a similar situation to what we saw with Jack Nickel last year. And and what we're finding out is, is that this sat this staff is one that is number one, willing to make the hard decisions. And part of it is, is telling a kid who's a great kid, who's done everything right, who has been loyal to you and done all those things that, Hey man, you know, we can't reciprocate it. And that, that kind of, concerns me and makes me feel for the kid but at the same time sean this is the life of playing big boy football on a recruiting trail you said something that's the key to this right because we both feel and understand both sides of this coin the fact that this staff was not the staff that originally recruited him made it a lot easier for them to come to this decision and probably have this conversation, which I would probably lean more to the side of the staff to say, okay, if you're going to establish the ground rules or the way you're going to do things, this is this is the conversation you have to have with this young right. man. And you have to be honest with him. And then you set the standard, you take the hit, but going forward, it's obvious the direction the entire staff knows how we're going to operate right. and we're not going to take I, I don't like saying these type of kids because that makes it seem like he wasn't make sure you're really sold on a kid before you yes. take them that's that's yeah. exactly exactly and as you said before Notre Dame fit per se absolutely did he do everything correctly mm-hmm. no I, I go back to a conversation I shared that I had with somebody else. Uh, that's in the recruiting world, and they alerted me to 80 to 90 kids. And I had never heard anyone say this. He said there are only 80 to 90 kids that are good enough in this country to play for Notre Dame. Mm -hmm. He said that's the mentality you have to have if you're going to win in Notre Dame. You can't widen that out to 150 to 200. Right. Because those are the same parameters for an Iowa State right. or Kansas State. Like if you're trying to win a championship, there are only a certain amount of kids that are good enough to play on your team. Right. And I think that's the parameters that this coaching staff is really trying to put in place now. Establishing this is the level of play we want our players to be at when we recruit them. And unfortunately, you're going to see some guys – that we can look back in the past and say to ourselves, you know what? That kid was a three-star when he committed to Notre Dame, and he gave Notre Dame four really good years. Yes. And I love the way he turned out. I love right. the way he Even if he wasn't a great player. Absolutely. Like and We're not talking are- about the three stars like Kyron Williams who end up playing, like I mean, becoming All-Americans. We're talking about the kids that, like Trevor Rulin. Mm-hmm. Right. I mean, Trevor Rulin was a spot starter at times, but you know, like that kid was a really good piece to your, to your equation for five years, you know, you, yeah. five years even, you know, and, and, and there's a need for kids like that, but yeah. you've got to be careful that those kids aren't being brought in at positions where you have a, a smaller number of players running back quarterback safety, yeah. right? 
you know, the the because you're you're going to have smaller numbers at those positions than other positions, Sean. And there was a question from John A. One that I want to address. That's part of this conversation too. He says Tommy Reese was OC when he committed. Was he not involved at all in Irvin's recruitment? No, his the decision to take Cedric Irvin was made by the running backs coach and the head coach. That's basically how that went down. And, and there's the other side of the coin is Sean is people say, you know, you're, you're, you're there was a, a question that John DeCrisio said or a comment that he made. And, and I think it speaks to, I think how some people feel it's loyalty yeah. not returned is just not right. Don't like it. Our word should be our word. And and I think there's a lot of value to that comment from John. However, what my, my question is, what is, what is better for the young man that you tell him now before he's taken any officials, he's got plenty of time to get his recruitment done. Do you do yeah. it now? Do you just keep loading up at running back and then force him out, which is what they did with Jack Nickel last year? It's supposed to, hey, Jack, we don't have a spot for you. They say, hey, we're going to still take you, but we're going to keep recruiting more running backs. Notre Dame was honest with Cedric from what I'm told. Whether you agree with it or not, that's a different – I mean, there that people can have legitimately different views on that that I respect. But what is better to tell him that, hey, we don't have a spot for you, or to bring a kid into your team knowing you don't think he can play for you, knowing that you're going to out-recruit him in this class and next year's class, and then what, he leaves in a year or two? Yeah. Like, what is what is the better thing for them, right? And look, if he showed up and he outplayed other guys, that's they're going to play him. They're not going to be like, well, we're not, you know. But it just, he's not that guy right now in their view. Some people may disagree with that, but that's the, it's just, it's not a simple answer as your word is your word. It's not that simple because you sticking to your word, it's like, okay, but I don't feel that way anymore. You know what I mean? Like, it's like staying in a relationship that you're not happy in just because, you know, you feel obligated is not healthy for either one of you. Right. 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 And then you only increase the heartbreak down the road when ultimately it doesn't work out, you know? And, and so in, and this is a relationship like that is, do you tell the kid the truth now or do you stick to your word, which is important? I probably shouldn't do air quotes because I, it is important. Your word needs to mean something. Absolutely. But at the same time, when, when circumstances change and you don't view that kid as someone who can play for you, do you bring him in anyway to keep your word or do you sit down and say, Hey, look, here's the reality of it. You're just, you're just not a guy that we see in our plans. So I, I don't think it's as easy of a, of a decision as maybe some people think, Sean, I do think it's a more complicated issue than people, than people. Is this think. an easier conversation? Because of course we're getting it from one side right now. Mm -hmm. We've yet to hear the other side because yeah. the conversation could have, I'll just, go ahead and just play it out, you know, how the conversation could have gone. The conversation could have been, we're, we we signed Jabrian Price. We already have a full running back room. Mm -hmm. uh, we have Jay Lamar that we're still recruiting. We got Richard Young and we have Jeremiah Love. Right. These are three guys we really like and we're recruiting all of them. Now, right. the way things are now, you can transfer in a year. If mm -hmm. you come in and play, but why would you waste that year when you can go, go and have early impact at a program? If we release you right now, and give you that opportunity to go find that team. Like we love you. We offered you, mm -hmm. but we're not going to stop recruiting these guys. Right. We want you to know that. Right. Now, if it's an open dialogue and his side says, well, we don't like that. We don't think it's fair. Well, I, understand that but this is how we're going to move forward right with this if you don't like that it's up to you we'll let you publicly say what you want to say right to talk about the situation we don't have to say anything and you can move on right now if they want if they take that as they basically told us we don't have room for you well that's not what was said but it's kind of what was implied right in a sense right now so, i don't know if that was directly said that's yeah. what i was told from his side of things no, that's what that's that's what i'm saying right. that's what we've been right. you've been told from that side right. so and, with that, and, that's and i'm working with that yeah, yeah and i'm working with that being the assumption whether it was directly or not because i think that's the to me that's the 
I think that whether it was implied or beat around the bush, I would much rather him actually done that. I, what I hate is when you just kind of, we're going to force a kid out without telling him that. We're just going to keep recruiting oh, that's them. Even worse. We've seen staffs do this where they just don't call a kid. That's worse. It's like that's that's petty and childish, right? Like they told him before the official visits, before, I mean, you know, look, I'd have been ticked if they'd have had the kid waste an official visit mm-hmm. and brought him up. Yeah. I, I, that would have been right. So there's not an easy way to do this. There's no. not a clean way to do this. The only way to do it is honesty. And now I'm still trying to get clarification for this, but I was told that it was a face-to-face conversation. I don't know that for a fact, but I was told it was, which, you know, I don't think it makes it any better for Cedric, but it says something about Notre Dame. If that, if that is in fact true again, I, that's just, we're all, we're just working on one side of this conversation for right now. But at the end of the day, the, 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 the whether you like it or not, and, and I'm not trying to change anybody's mind. No, I don't like it either way, but I understand it. And and when I say I don't like it, it's not that I'm I don't I don't criticize Notre Dame. For, I actually am fine with what Notre Dame did, as long as they did it what we're hearing they did, which was you know it was a face to face conversation. It was an honest conversation. It wasn't a beating around the bush. It wasn't a stringing the kid on. It was here's the deal. You know I don't love it. I feel for Cedric because again this is a kid. This isn't a kid that was taking visits to other schools. He wasn't like not communicating with the staff. He was he was coming up on visits. He was selling the program. He was doing everything that you ask a commit to do. Mm-hmm. It's just the reality is, as you look at it and say, are, are we going to win a title with this kid or not? And maybe they maybe they may regret it. But this is how they feel, and they were honest about it. And and I can respect that, even though I can also hurt for the kid, because I think Cedric is very much a Notre Dame type of kid. I agree, but. You're also dealing with 85 scholarships and you're you're dealing you're trying to win championships, which is why kids like that you don't take early. You don't put you know, that's why you should always you, you can get a kid like that later if you miss yeah. out on yeah. other players. Same thing with Jack Nickel. You could have got if Notre Dame never would have taken Jack Nickel early and missed out on tight ends, they could have flipped him for Michigan State at the end of the process if he would have gone there first. Yeah. And so that's why I say is like I just I don't see the need to you know, take kids like that early. And then that, that, so how the conversation got into what we're going to discuss the rest of the show, Sean, is that conversation where I think you and I are both on the same page. We hate it for the kid. Got a ton of respect for Cedric Irvin Jr. I mean, I I said this yesterday, Sean, I'm going to be rooting for that kid wherever he goes. Yeah. Just, he's an easy kid to root for. Yeah. And, and he's a good football player. He's just not a, you're trying to beat Bama and Clemson and Ohio State type, type, type football player. Yeah, can I say that? Because I know there are a lot of people in the message board that agree with us, don't like the way it's going down. But mm-hmm. honestly, over the last year, this is what most of us have been asking for. Yes. If we'll be real. I didn't ask you this, Sean, but it just popped in my head when you said that. I personally – would have a different opinion of this, and I would be hammering Notre Dame if the same staff that took his commitment was the staff that took it away. Yeah. Like, let's say Brian Kelly didn't leave and Lance Taylor was still – or even if Brian Kelly was still here and it was just a different running backs coach. Everything else is the same. Yeah. But if Lance Taylor was still here and Brian Kelly was still here, I'd be a lot more ticked about it. Not because I'm upset with Brian Kelly or Lance Taylor. It's a chance – it's just – you you're the one that made this decision. Right. Like if it was Marcus and Deland and Tommy, you made the decision. Just because you got buyer's remorse now, you don't punish the kid for it, right. right? Like I'd I'd be much more critical of it if they did it. And and so like if they decided like I don't even want to use a kid that's actually committed because then people will start oh it's, you know Notre Dame may drop so and so, but if right. if they start if they offered a kid in you know February, got his commitment, and then changed their mind down the road, I'd hammer them for it. The reason I'm more willing to embrace this as an understandable thing is because it was a different staff and different coaches that recruited him initially and took his commitment. I guess my only thing that I'd say is, is you probably should have figured this out sooner. You should have given Cedric a heads up on this sooner. You know, like, did it really, did you really need five, five, you know, five months to figure out that Cedric wasn't a guy you really wanted? And say, well, yeah, because you needed to find out if other kids were interested in your program. So that's fair. I, I get it. I, I get that, right? It took some time to see yourself with Jeremiah Love and Jay Lamar, and then now you're getting Richard Young on campus, right? And you've got a shot there. So, 
you know, I, I, I'm more sympathetic, Sean, because of the fact that it, it was because there was a coaching change. Yeah. A significant one on that side of the ball. I, I, I'm more, I'm more well willing to say, okay. And this, I, I understand it. Totally different than the one we saw with Justin Rett, where right. it was, yo, lock in. Like if you're right. locked in, lock in. Urban Jr. was locked in. <laughs> Without a doubt, Notre Dame kid wanted to come to Notre Dame. And we talked about this last night. You get a new running back coach in, and you can't blame him for beating the bushes mm-hmm. to see what pops up with the top yeah. talent at that position. And, yo, Richard Young pops up. And right. go watch his film. Jeremiah like, Love know. pops up. Yeah, Jeremiah Love wasn't on the board when, when Lance Dean McCullough got hired. He wasn't. Absolutely. Right. Absolutely. And this is what, I, as I said before, for a long time, we've seen Notre Dame have great running games without going after the top running backs in the right. nation. They've done it. Harry Heastan has made it happen, and they've developed running backs that eventually matriculated to the NFL, drafted in the third, fourth, or fifth round. Some And some didn't get drafted. Josh and Adams. Didn't get drafted, but they were right. productive. Right. Right? Now – you're going to put next level talent mm-hmm. behind that offensive line. You can only expect an even greater running game than we've seen under Harry Heastan right. at Notre Dame. And that's the vision that that lines right up with what Marcus Freeman right. did immediately as defensive coordinator when he came in and he right. started recruiting a different athlete right. on defense than previously previously was. And that leads kind of into the segue of where this conversation is going to go, Sean, is this situation with Cedric, as un, as as much of it is a bummer for him. Yeah. And, and you know, I, I don't feel – I understand it. I don't feel great about it. It's hard to feel great about a kid had a dream. He wanted to play at Notre Dame, and it was he's always said it's a no-brainer to play at Notre Dame, and now that's gone. I, yeah. That makes my heart hurt a little bit. You know yeah, what I mean? I agree. I agree. But – you know, take that part away from it. And, and especially for you, cause you're a parent. I mean, I, I'm not even a parent. I couldn't imagine what it's like as a parent going through that kind of thing, you know? Yeah. But take that away. This is, this is to me symbolic of the fact that Notre Dame is recruiting in a whole different mindset. And we kind of talked about how do we discuss this? And it was really come about what's different. Sean is Notre Dame's recruiting culture is now different. It is. It is not just a oh well. You're working. I mean, it's an it's an entire cultural change in recruiting. Meaning, it, it it's this is a staff that has a completely different outlook on the importance of recruiting than the previous staff did. This is a staff that not only understands how important recruiting is, and it's not that it's just something you have to do, but something you you need to do and want to do, whether you enjoy it or not, because. N- Love, you know, putting great value on recruiting doesn't mean you love recruiting. I just know that if I want to win a championship, this is something I got to do and I got to do it well. Right. There's also a thought of, you know, the whole expression that was used previously, the, the shopping down a different aisle thing. And and that's been completely like dismissed. And like, you know, we're not doing that anymore. The aisle we're shopping down is the aisle that's going to lead to a national championship. And, and so that means that some of the kids that we were getting before, we're going to keep getting, yeah. right? And, and it's not just the elite players. I don't care who your coach is. Of course, you're going to recruit Michael Mayer. Of course, you're going to recruit Kyle, Kyle Hamilton. You know, but there's still that level of, okay, find those kids that maybe aren't the big-time recruits that you think can become big-time players, right? Yeah. I hope this staff would still recruit a guy like Avery Davis. And they are. Those versatile guys can play different things. You know, but it's about upping your overall talent level especially some of the impact positions. And the way to do that is, is is you've got to be willing to make the tough decision sometimes, like we just talked about. There's another tough decision that the staff is talking about that we won't talk a ton about, but the Dante Moore situation. You ha- you're in a situation where you've got a kid who you have said, all of our chips are in, you know, in the table for this kid. All of our eggs are in the basket. Pick whatever phrase you want to use. They're all in on Dante Moore. Right. He's taking official visits. He's at Michigan this weekend. There's all these different things that could lead you to say, you know what? And and we see it in this chat all the time. You know, they they need to find somebody. They need to find a backup plan. And this staff is saying, no, we're going to stay 
the course. Yeah. That is not an easy decision because you're there's going to be some panic of like this kid is not set up a visit, you know, to 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 us he hasn't publicly announced when he's coming to see us. He's not, you know, he's saying weekends, but he's not locking in for sure. He's definitely locking in visits to here, here and here, but what about us? There's a lot of things that if you aren't confident in your relationship with that kid can cause you to overreact and say, "Okay, you know what? We're going to go take so and so." Right. But this staff is staying on course. You know, they're they're not they're not falling for it. And I think you you follow their actions. That's not an easy decision. And I don't know. And this is this is not an attempt to 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 take a shot at the previous staff. It's just the reality. They would not have gone this deep into the Dante Moore recruitment without a quarterback. They would have moved on in April and gone and found someone else because you can't afford to miss. Right. This is another example. And I think it leads to the next point, Sean, which is the culture of this program now from a recruiting standpoint is it's real simple, Sean. We're Notre Dame. That's well said. Simply, we're Notre Dame. That's well said. Yeah. And well, Alabama have- offered this kid. We're Notre Dame. Notre Dame. Yeah, but Ohio State's the leader for this kid. We're we're, we're Notre Dame. Yeah. You really think you're going to get that many players out of the state of Texas with Sark there? Yeah, we're Notre Dame. That's the mindset that this staff has, and it's it means we'll go anywhere, any place for any player against any team, and I love it. And that's been represented recently. We saw the coaching staff; they've been all over the country. Most people thought, especially in the recruiting world, that as soon as Lincoln Riley took the job at USC, that the pipeline that was normally from modern day would pick back up and you wouldn't see kids leave modern day and go to Alabama like we saw Bryce Young. And guess what Notre Dame did in the month of May? They walked into modern day and they offered three kids. Right. Like, we don't care. Right. Yes. We're coming after them, too. We're putting right. everybody on notice. They've already tr- planted a flag in Texas. Tommy Reese has replanted the flag in the Chicago area. Mm-hmm. They've hit Ohio. They've hit the DMV area. They're planting flags yeah, all Al over. Gold, the IMG scrimmage the other night. Absolutely. Like, okay, here we are. We're Notre I'm Dame. Here. Absolutely. That's it. We're Notre Dame. And mm-hmm. it's not in an arrogant way. Like, when I first kind of got into coaching, Sean, I remember I was recruiting – and I, he's a D1 coach now, but there was a high school coach. It was Ryan Williams, high school coach. Remember Ryan Williams, a running back yeah. that went to Virginia Tech? Virginia Tech. Yeah. He and I were having a conversation, a really good dude. And he, you know, we knew I he found out I was a Notre Dame fan. And he was like, Yeah, you know, like we don't, you know, don't really care much for the Notre Dame coaching staff. And I'm like, Oh, yeah. Why is that? Because this is like 04. You know, this is like the end of the tie era. Yeah. And he's like, They're always the last school in for kids. Cause it's like, it was a reputation, like all the Northern Virginia coaches felt this way. They're always the last last school in on a kid. They walk into the school with their little interlocking ND, like, you know, and, and treat you not like we're Notre Dame, like we're not afraid of you, we're Notre Dame, but more of like we're Notre Dame, bow to us. Right. You know, and it's like, dude, none of these kids know who you are. None of these kids know these, – these kids weren't alive when – you know, and that's what the people say. These kids weren't alive when Lou Holtz was winning and stuff like that. You know, like they don't remember all that. They remember what you are now, which is not very good, you know, and – right. And it, it was about lack of work, just thinking you're going to walk in the door and we're Notre Dame and kids are just going to flock to us. No, this staff is saying, we're Notre Dame. We're not afraid of you. Now, they also understand too, Sean, and this is key. That means you got to work. You got to outwork these schools. And what you're seeing on a recruiting trail is you're now seeing Alabama following Notre Dame. Yes. Unless maybe they're not doing this directly. But you're now see Alabama, like Notre Dame gets on Ronan Hannafin early. They get a commit from a Don Shula earlier. They get there's all these kids and Notre Dame gets on early. And then all of a sudden, next thing you see, Monroe Freeling. Now all of a sudden, Alabama's following suit. It used to be the other way around, where Notre Dame either wouldn't get on a kid that Alabama wanted, or when Alabama would get on a kid, they'd kind of like, well, there goes that. Right. You know, where this staff is like, I mean, think about it. George and Alabama both offered to Don Shula and were like, huh, whatever. You know, I mean, that's fine. He's not going there. Like, think about that. Yeah. And, and you, you know, where it's – but it, it requires hard work. And that's the thing is I haven't heard a single thing about a single coach on the staff that's not working. And that that's not been true ever that, since I've become a Notre Dame. There's always at least three or four guys that just don't work. <laughs> at least. 
In this staff, it's not the case. No. Now, some guys aren't as effective right now. Their success isn't what others are, but they're working. Yeah. And and it's it's a but it it, it all comes down to a culture change, Sean. It's a it's a culture change that involves, you know, we are we are capable of beating anybody for any kid anywhere, any place in time. And but we also know we got to work at it. We got to put in the work. We have to have a different message and all this stuff. We have to have all of this stuff all lined up and ready to rock and roll. Yep. And I think that's an important thing. And I think now again, and they're not perfect. There's been some missteps. There's been some communication issues at time. They're not even a, a, a completely well old machine yet. They're not there yet, which makes me even more fired up about what this thing can be when they really get a year or two years, you know, doing it the way that Marcus Freeman wants to do it. That's that's when you start to get really fired up about what this group can be. We're waiting to see what the on-field product is going to look like. You just touched on something. The competitive spirit of this staff of one another lends me to believe that once we actually see this team take the field, that's going to transfer to mm -hmm. this team. You talked about everybody putting in that work. We saw Harry Heastan have a good two or three weeks. Then we saw Al Washington come on, have a good two or three weeks. We anticipate that Chancey Stuckey mm -hmm. is going to have some good signs. Already has a top 100 kid. Already has a yeah. Absolutely. And now – Who's the one person that's been in the wings working really hard and all of a sudden he gets a visit from possibly the best right. running back in the nation? It's yeah. Dylan McCullough. Right. He's been behind the scenes, you know, beating the bushes, seeing what he can make happen, putting in that work. They push each other. And they push each other because they can't look at the main guy up top and say, oh, well, he's resting. Right. You know, when you right. have a top guy out there out working everybody, putting in calls more than everybody on the staff and all of the commits is amazing. I shared this. I think Malik and I talked about this and it's amazing that we talked to kids that are committed elsewhere that didn't choose Notre Dame. And they still say, yo, Marcus Freeman still calls me to this day. Mm -hmm. Like no one called me more than Marcus Freeman. Like, so when you hear it being reported, that he's the lead recruiter. We're not just saying that. He's putting in that work. He's showing the action. And he expects his staff to follow his leadership. And right now, that's exactly what they're doing. That's exactly what they're doing. And like you said, the culture has changed. It's shifted. Notre Dame fans have been asking for this. Right. They've been asking for this. So we really can't complain about when the shift took place and some of the fallout from the shift because there was going to be fallout mm -hmm. when and wherever it took place and however it took place. Unfortunately, a young man gets caught in the crossfire. Right. No one likes it. Right. Could him, could his family, could the young man and his family bad mouth Notre Dame on a recruiting trail after this, they could. But like you said, from what you've heard, the fact that they took, they had enough integrity to go to him face to face. His father has been in the coaching business. Sure. His father understands how tough. I would hope. He yeah. Did. It doesn't mean he has to like it or be no, happy he, about it. Because right. his son is hurt. Right. I wouldn't like it. Right. You hurt my son. Right. I'm going to take issue with it. And my son did everything right. My son did Absolutely. everything you asked him to do. He, he, he didn't take other visits. Absolutely. You know, you're taking these kids, you know, like these other kids that are committed, you're letting them go on these visits. My kid did everything right. He's been recruiting for you. He did everything right. I'd be pissed. Yeah. I would. But I think yeah. at the same time, you also understand. And his dad playing at that level also, I think, gives him a level of like, look, look you know, you know what this is like, right? Like, yeah. but it, it you know, but the reason you're not seeing this on defense, though, is because, again, the defense has been established last year. Last year. There wasn't the turnover on defense that we saw right. on offense. And, and and again, it's 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 disappointing for the kid, but I understand it. I don't like it, but I'm good with it. If You know, so I have all these conflicted views on it. But at the end of the day, this is what needs to be done to play big boy football. 
you know, and, and that's the reality of it. It's just, there's a right way and a wrong way to do it. I think they, they did the wrong thing the right way. And when I say wrong thing, my general impression of feeling is that you, if you take a kid's commitment, you honor it. I'm a believer in that. Yeah. There are circumstances, however, where it's understandable. Uh, a kid's circumstances change. He didn't do the work in the classroom. He had a major injury. Even then, I'm still like, okay, bring him in and put him on scholarship, right? I mean, you know, and put him on a medical or something. But right. there's all types of situations where, you know, I, I understand it. I don't like it, but I understand it. This is one of those ones where I'm more understanding of it because yeah. of the coaching change aspect of it. But I still don't like, oh, yeah, I'm not cheering it. I'm not I'm not celebrating it because I there's another person on the other end of this that didn't do anything wrong. He just, you know, perceived to be not quite to the level that they want. And we see, but it still needs to be done, them. though, Sean. That's the thing. It still needed to be done yeah. for both sides. It yeah. it was right for them to do it, and it's good for Cedric. It may sting now. Yeah. But when he's going to a different school and rushing for a thousand yards, is instead of being the third or fourth string running back in Notre Dame, yeah. it's going to end up being the best thing for him. And maybe this gives him a little bit of a, an extra chip on his shoulder that he goes out and plays well. I hope that happens. I hope he finds a school where he can go and he is the guy for them. You and I are talking about this with another recruit yesterday and I won't yeah. say who it is, but like, yeah. is it better for this kid to be the fourth or fifth guy at Notre Dame mm -hmm. or the number one guy somewhere else? Yeah. And in his instance and Cedric's instance, I think in both situations, it's better for them to go somewhere else and be the guy. And, you know, I, I, as a person, I'd love for Cedric Irvin to be part of this class. And he's a solid player. I mean, I gave him a four-star grade, but he also had a four-star upside because he just kind of he just he's just a solid player, top three hundred kind of player. They want impact guys, and I just you, don't think he is that. You have had the opportunity to speak to Marcus Freeman more than I have, and in doing so, whomever it was in front of the Urban family, and however they decided to present it. If Cedric Irvin Jr. looked them in the face and said, I don't care, coach, I still want to come, do you think they, you know? What, meaning like walk on? Like I said, once again, we don't know how yeah. it was truly presented. My understanding is, is that it was made very clear that the spot isn't there anymore. And, and I can follow up. You know, I'm going to follow up with another source now that I'm trying to get some clarity on it. But that okay. that's my understanding of it. Um. It, what was it was that you know so but e even if it was that you know well, like to me you needed i would rather it be that yeah. than some sort of beating around the bush yeah. you know try to walk the kid into the decision like there's because i think they've tried that i mean i think it's been kind of obvious that like they're looking for two to three more backs i mean they've said very i mean they've they've made it clear to people that they've wanted, they want, they're going to take a third back in this class, you know, like a Jeremiah love if they can get them. Yeah. And, and Cedric wasn't taking the hit because he loves Notre Dame. Right. And that's the thing that sucks. Right. Um, but again, at the end of the day, Sean, this is, this is big boy football. I mean, that, that's what, that's what this, this is, is the way it's done. Right. And we've wanted the Notre Dame recruiting to step up. Right. And go to the next level, and we expected Marcus right. Freeman to do that, right? And no, no one really knows behind the scenes how you do that at this level, right? Yeah. And sometimes you have to make these type of right. decisions to be able to get to that level, yeah. And it's unfortunate because Notre Dame represents. We feel like Notre Dame represents the best of what college football is all about, and you don't want this type of story out there. If you're a Notre Dame fan, heck, I don't think the Notre Dame staff would like to have this story out there right now. You know, they would have loved for him to get the idea based upon what was being said and say, you know what? I think I'm going to open my recruitment back up right. on his own. But he didn't. And ultimately, they had to go ahead and make the decision, the tough decision, to have the conversation with the young man and do things that need to be done to elevate the recruiting at that position. Right. Right. But if you want to recruit like the big boys, you've got to make the tough decision sometimes. And that's what this was, I believe. Isn't it amazing in high school? At least for me and my experience, the prettiest girls would always always end up with the weirdest guys. Because 
all the guys that really liked her were too scared to say something. And then the most awkward guy would actually walk up, introduce himself, have a conversation, and end up with her. And, you know, you don't want to be that awkward program right. that's scared to go talk to the right. top guys. And sure. Notre Dame, in some way, has been caught in that matrix, per se, of just being in the haze of, well, you know, the top guys are talking to her. Top guys are trying to get him. Like you said, Alabama offered him. So, well, we might as well not even try. No. But we better get a backup plan just in case. Absolutely. Oh, no. yeah. get in the fray. Fight. Going back right. to what you said. We're Notre Dame. Yeah. Like, that's the best. That is the best icebreaker in the in all of college football. There is no better yeah. icebreaker. Yeah. My name is such and so. I'm the position coach at Notre Dame. Yeah. And we like you and we want to make an offer. That, yeah. There's no Fair. other way to interest no better way to introduce yourself to a kid. You got to come with that though, Sean. That's the thing yeah. is you can't you got to come. Like you almost have to have a little bit of a brashness, you know? Yeah. And yeah, you you just it's just you can't just kind of walk in like you know hey we're trying to do some things. I mean you know it's one of my favorite you know is it GIF GIF whatever however you say it uh, that I like to used to use all the time. It's the one of Vince Vince McMahon just like pimp walking down the you know down the steps right and you know like Con Connor what's the the, the MMA guys the Connor um, McGregor right and then yeah. you know, he's got that stupid thing you know but it's like Arms. but it's you're just walking in the room like hey we're here and yeah. you've talked about this before Sean where you know, the Notre Dame coaches are kind of like breaking up the party. You know, there's this party that 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 Ohio State and Georgia and Alabama mm -hmm. and Clemson have been having by themselves. And and like SEC short should make a video about this if they were willing to do like a, a pro Notre Dame thing, which they wouldn't. But it's like you could see them like having this, you know, the 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 four people in the room and it's an Ohio State and it's Bama and it's Georgia and it's Clemson, and they're just kind of yeah. You know, it's, it's going to be one of them every year. And then occasionally in LSU, they'll, they'll let them in. And then, you know, but Notre Dame's kind of like, no, we're, we're busting this party. We're, we're breaking this party up. You know, we're, you know, we're, we're, we're going to be party crashers. And we know you don't want us here, right? right? Because you hate everything we rep that we represent, but we're coming whether you like it or not. And that's the mentality you got to have. And that's the mentality this, that Marcus Freeman has brought to this staff. It's a, and it's not in an obnoxious way. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a real matter of fact, like, Hey, y'all look, we know you don't like it. We don't care. We're here and we're Notre Dame. And you know, your days of your days of the days of us shopping down a different aisle are over, you know, we're, we're coming right down your aisle and we plan on, you know, taking some of your stuff. We're going to take some of your groceries and we're going to, you know, we're going to be the ones that, that land these kids. And so, and that's, that, I mean, that's what you got to be. And, and that's what I love about this staff. So and you know what? Salute to I said this, and he's done a lot of things. And you know, a lot of people might not particularly like him as a person, and that's fine. But the further I get away from the ultimate decision that was made that led to Marcus Freeman becoming the head coach, the guts it took to make that decision. Mm -hmm. I took I took my cap to Jack Swarbrick. I really do. And I tip my cap to him jumping out in front of name, image, and likeness and letting it be known. We're going to wait to see how things play out. We're not about to participate right. like everybody else. Right. I think he's done a great job. He's a very, very good leader. He has no problem putting his neck yeah. on the line and saying, yo, come for me. If it right. doesn't work out, come for me. Same thing with Marcus Freeman. Mm -hmm. I'm taking a risk. I know I'm taking a risk, but I feel like he's the right guy. And right now, the early returns on his decision to hire Marcus Freeman, they seem to be going very well. Yep. Ultimately, that would be determined by, you know, win-loss record on the field. But, yo, I have to tip my cap to Jack Swarbrick right now because things are trending in the right direction. You know, even if he's coming to the end of his tenure, as the athletic director, what he's done for this program in a lot of different areas up to this point during his tenure, I think he's done a really good job. 